And in some ways, I think what I'm going to end up doing here is a little bit of a big switch on the topic. We're going to talk about uh, the relationship between Christianity or maybe religion more generally and evolution, okay? But maybe not in the way we typically talk about it. Okay? I think there's a problem in this vicinity that we talk about less, okay? And it's actually, I think, the greater problem that evolution poses, okay, for religious belief in general and, and including Christianity. So to get that out, I want to, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to have as little like like picky picky uh, you know, detailed definitions and on the logic as possible to talk. But I want to get a couple definitions out in the front here, so you're going to sort of bear with me on that. And won't, I won't spend the whole time reading to you about P's and Q's and this and that. So if you look at um, the top of the handout, I give you two kinds of compatibility. The first I'm going to call just plain old direct incompatibility. And you know, here's my definition of it. So two beliefs, A and B, doesn't matter what they are, two things that you might believe, okay, are incompatible in this sense if either A and B cannot both be true or A and B entail or otherwise strongly imply, given the general facts of the world, other claims that cannot both be true. For example, the belief that Paris is the capital of the Fifth French Republic has a first order, or what I'm calling here, direct incompatibility with Paris is a lake in Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, it, one cannot reasonably hold both of those points. I should say, but in terms of that, is uh, the one belief, given what we know about the world, right? even though it's not a strict logical con contradiction, given the facts of the world that lakes are not capitals of republics, right? uh, you, can't, you cannot be reasonable and hold. Right? Uh, you're, you're in some way incompatible with your own beliefs if you say Paris is the capital of, of uh, the Fifth French Republic and at the same time you claim to believe that it's a in Wisconsin. Does that make sense? And I think this is the sense of incompatible that we're more comfortable with. Okay. And thereby, I'm going to talk less about that and then you'll be less comfortable with what we're going to do, but that's okay. okay. So uh, I want to now talk about what I'm going to call indirect incompatibility. So two beliefs are incompatible in this sense. If holding one of the beliefs, A, right, were good reason for us to doubt our standing to hold the other. That is, two beliefs, A and B, are epistemically or whatever, decided there to call indirectly compatible. If holding A gives us good reason to doubt that we are in any position to make a justified or otherwise warranted judgment regarding B. A and B could both be true, but holding A means that one cannot likewise also claim reasonably to hold B. For example, the belief that I am generally poor, a generally poor judge of character is difficult to hold alongside the belief that Smitty possesses a fine character. Okay, so if you, if you know about yourself, you generally don't judge people's character very well. Right? There's something a little wrong with you. Right? You don't read people well. Okay? got this tick. And then someone appears to you know that about yourself. So someone appears to you to have a great character. You, you should kind of mistrust that about yourself, right? There's something wrong on your side of things, right? Even though Smitty might be a fine character, right? He might really be that, okay? It's not a contradiction, but it's that, that knowing that you're not a good judge of these things, right, would make you mistrust your judgments about this character. So at the very least, you have to investigate, right? You have to ask someone else or something like that. Okay. Another example of this sort of thing is, is if I look out my office window, and my office window overlooks like fields in Missouri and across the Missouri River, and I see sheep out there. Okay. If I go to my colleagues and I say, you know, uh, those are sheep, and my colleague says, no, 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 they're not. They could be people dressed up like sheep. Right. Uh, I'm going to think my colleagues are a little weird, right? Okay, but let's suppose uh, I read in the, in the newspaper that morning, right, that beware of roving sheep bandits of, afoot in Missouri, right, and there's guys out there looking to rob people dressed like sheep, and I look out my window, I tend to want to believe those are just, those are sheep over there in the field, but I should mistrust that about myself, right, in that case, because this other belief I have is telling me there's something wrong in what's going on here. 
such that I shouldn't necessarily trust my judgment. There's something under me. You can see my phone. Okay. Um, and typically, when we talk about the compatibility of Christianity and evolution, uh, what one has in mind is something more like direct incompatibility. Right? We, we, we say that there's certain doctrinal claims that Christians hold to, right? Uh, it may be a certain creation story. Okay? Uh, maybe it's a time frame for it, right? Uh, or maybe just a broad outline of, of how things are in Genesis. Maybe it's that all of humanity is descended from a single male female pair, pair right? That comes up a lot, right? Uh, maybe it's the idea that you know, human beings uh, were. Uh, Maybe it's the, it's the idea that uh, you know all human beings are descended from a single uh, original breeding pair or something like that, or maybe it's the claim that human beings came about by a special act of creation. Whatever. There's all these things that seem to be a part on some versions of like like basic Christian doctrine that at times don't seem to sit terribly well with some of the, like the, the basic claims of, of evolutionary theory, right? Okay, and usually what we worry about when we worry about is Christianity compatible with evolution is can we square that, right? Can we square that? Can we show that what looks like to be a contradiction there in fact is not a contradiction, okay? Um, I'm not going to worry about that tonight, all right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone, right? For a number of reasons. One, I think it's done very often. It's been done very well. Um, I think my colleague Matthew Ramage from Benedictine has done it very well for the TI before. Uh, and moreover, I think it also gets into questions about Christian doctrine and questions about uh, how we read scripture that are frankly above my pay grade. Okay, um, so I, I won't be weighing on that. But I do want to talk to you about the possibility of Christianity being incompatible with evolution in this indirect sense. Would, if, if it were, if we, if we can see that evolution is how the species got here in some way, shape, or form. Does that serve to undermine, it, like does that give us some reason to worry that we in fact don't have very good standing to hold our religious beliefs? Does it undermine it, right? Is it like discovering, hey, I want to say Smitty has a fine character, but at the same time realizing I shouldn't trust myself about that, okay? That there's some, something else I know about the world that makes me think I'm not reliable, okay? Um, it's that problem that I want to discuss today, okay? So, uh, before we get into that and, like, why you might even worry about that in the first place, I just want to put out just two just blanket terms I'm going to use, all right? So, hereafter, when you see on the handout, capital E, evolution, I'm just taking there, that's the claim that religious belief is explained by reproductive fitness as it accrued to our prehistoric ancestors, okay? So, it's the idea that our tendency to be religious animals is something that can be given an evolutionary explanation in terms of reproductive fitness, okay? And religion, all right, uh, by religion what I mean is there are supernatural entities or principles that are somehow relevant to our conduct, okay? That, that um, religion is a set of beliefs and it's a set of beliefs uh, about things that are not of this world in the straightforward sense, and it makes a difference to us how we behave in light of those beliefs, okay? All right, that's stage study. Now, why would someone think that there might be an indirect compatibility between evolution, as I'm defining it here, right, the notion that uh, our, our human disposition to be religious has an evolutionary history, right, or explanation, and, the, and religion simply as a belief, okay? I'm gonna quote to you from Roger Scruton, all right? He was a recently late uh, philosopher. Um, and no, what I'm quoting here is not his view. I just think he articulates a view that he actually disagrees with very well, okay? So let me, I'm gonna read this quote from Scruton. There's a widespread sense that social facts that were previously understood as part of culture are now to be explained as adaptations, and that when we have explained them, we have removed their aura, so to speak, deprived them of any independent hold on our beliefs and emotions, and reduced them to aspects of our biology. So closely do traditional religions fit the strategies of our genes, 
and so callously do they seem to favor the genotype over the phenotype, that it is tempting to say that there is little or nothing more to, re to the religious urge. It is an adaptation like any other, and it seems to be rooted so deeply within us as to be beyond the reach of rational argument. Th and this is entirely to be expected, since that is how adaptations are passed on. Okay. What Scruton has in mind there, and you know, you've probably seen these kinds of claims before, you know, uh, when it comes to moral matters. Um, you know, like, like we might point out like humans are somehow distinctive because we have certain moral intuitions. Um, and like those moral intuitions might lead us to great acts of self-sacrifice, right? They might lead us to, you know, uh, like acts of virtue that don't seem to make much sense uh, in evolutionary terms. But then there's, there's, an, there's kind of a retort to that, right? Is like the more we learn about, or you know, the more that's theorized about evolution, uh, the more it seems that what's really driving it isn't like my individual self-interest, it's the interests of my genes, such that uh, I might in fact be called on, right, to like make grave individual sacrifices, right, uh, in the interest of propagating, right, genes at least that are close to mine which in the long run is good, right, for the species. Do you see, you see that, all right? And you see these arguments, and people say, well, so what you think is a moral mandate, or you think is an absolute moral prohibition or a moral law, or you think is this distinctive human capacity for altruism, no, it's just one more uh, artifact of an adaptive advantage that our prehistoric ancestors had, right, that served for us to, like, out-reproduce our competitors, okay? This is a fairly familiar argument. And, and you can see how that this would fit an in indirect incompatibility, because it's saying, yeah, you want to say you have, you're making reasonable moral judgments, but in fact, maybe we're not such good judges about that, because we're not really judging this for moral reasons, we're judging this for really reproductive reasons, right? Or at least reasons that were reproductively useful a long time ago, okay? And increasingly, if, if you look at <clears throat> a lot of literature, these kinds of arguments are applied not just to moral beliefs, uh, but also to religious beliefs in pretty sophisticated ways. Okay, so I'm going to read you a quotation from a uh, recently retired um, uh, psychologist by the name of Matthew Rossano. And Rossano's an interesting guy. Uh, his, I highly recommend his book, Supernatural Selection, uh, where he gives a very, very interesting account of the emergence of religion in evolutionary terms, okay? And, and Rossano, interestingly, is a, a, as far as I know, is actually a, a very devoted Catholic, okay? Um, but I think he, he also, at the same time, is, he gives a very interesting account of the emergence of religion, okay? So I want to read this from Rossano here, okay? Uh, Shortly after 100,000 years before the present, Neanderthals displaced humans in the Levant, pushing them back to their African homeland. Recent genetic evidence indicates that around 70,000 years before the present, a select subset of modern human population in Africa uh, began a dramatic expansion. From out of Africa, a new species emerged that could no longer be turned back. It is around this time that we have the first evidence of religion. Our ancestors had enlisted the this, this supernatural as a player in their social world. And this, I believe, made all the difference in their social transformation, end quote, okay? So the story that Rossano has to tell, and he's got some very interesting evidence in the book, is that basically our uh, you know, human ancestors, right, or nearly human ancestors, attempted to, you know, migrate, you know, long-term out of Africa into basically the Middle East, the Levant, and we basically got our butts kicked by the Neanderthals, and we had to head back into Africa, okay? And then there's this, there's this interim period wh where we're in Africa, okay? And then we go back and, well, no more Neanderthals and here we are, right? So on the second round, we win, okay? And um, this is a very important moment in human evolution. And R what Rossano makes the case is that what happened in that interim period that really, really made the big difference was the emergence of religion, okay? Um, and he connects it with all these cognitive skills like working memory uh, that are extremely important to distinctively human intelligence. He thinks he can give a, a, a very important role for religion in the development of these cognitive powers, which then go on to give us this great advantage, right, over the Neanderthal and everything else, OK? 
okay. And, um, and he makes the point, it has a lot to do too, like religion you know, bonds us to groups, right? Religion like, makes us employ abstraction and all these things that became very advantageous to us, okay? And, and so in some way, in, in Rosano's case, is like he thinks you can, you can like really, you have to link religion now to like basic human mental health and all this stuff. So he's, he's trying to make like a kind of pragmatic case for religion, all right? But there's something kind of distressing here too though, right? Because basically on this account, um, we became religious ultimately because it gave us this advantage in like wiping out the Neanderthals, right? You see what I mean? And so it's, it's this, like you see this in Nietzsche too, is like, like what we thought was morality like had its origin in like reproductive and violent advantage, right? What we thought was like religion, right? Had its, had its you know, like we see this thing as making us noble and like, you know, moral actually has its origin in, you know, a, like sexual advantage and warfare and all this. Do, do you see that? Okay. And, and, and these are, and, and once again, you, you can find in, in, like, in both Scruton and Rosano, you should see these are like, these are friendly objections, right? Okay, they're, they're both, you know, Scruton was a Catholic, but he was, he was a Christian of some sort, and Rassan was a Catholic. But you can find these arguments. Like, you can find all sorts of arguments from people like Dennett, right, uh, making a case about, like, religion is just a byproduct of adaptive advantage. Religion is just a byproduct of adaptive advantage, okay? Um, and I want to ask, does that give us something to worry about, <laughs> all right, if indeed that's why we're religious, or in some sense why we're religious, okay? So to pursue that, I want to make another distinction. Okay, um, this is a very familiar distinction in contemporary philosophy, um, and so I, I want to be able to employ it in how we discuss this. Okay, so I want to distinguish between two spaces in a metaphorical sense. Okay, so there's what what often gets called the space of reasons. Okay, and it's really what I'm going to give you is two senses of the English word because. Okay, so in the space of reasons, we might say of Smitty. Smitty believes in the multiverse because he has read the astrophysics literature. Okay. There's another sense of because. What, what I'm going to say is because in the space of causes. Smitty believes in the multiverse because he drank a great deal of cough syrup. Okay. All right. And I think either of those accounts might have you ending up thinking that we're like in one of infinitely many possible worlds. Okay. Right. Or many actual worlds in this case. Do you see that? But we don't mean the same thing by because there, right? In the first instance, in the space of causes, excuse me, pardon me, in the space of reasons, we're saying, we're explaining Smitty's belief based on its rational credentials, right? Like we're saying like Smit, Smitty is in a good position to make this judgment, right? Such that like we think he's justified or warranted, right? If we asked him his reasons, right, he could maybe cite those reasons. Okay, and we would be engaged in sort of a logical exchange with Smitty. Okay, now it could turn out that the the multiverse is false, or isn't there is no such thing. But we still might say Smitty was in the space of reasons when he came to the belief, right? Because he did it based on evidence, following the logic of the evidence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so I'm not saying if it's in the space of reasons it's true. I'm saying if it's in the space of reasons it's reasonable. Okay. Likewise, though, if Smitty's been like, if we say he believes the multiverse because he drank too much cough syrup, right? Now we're not saying it's a rational position he's holding. We're saying that he's been somehow drugged, right? There's something is causing his cognitive apparatus to like go one way or another, right? And it's not evidentially based. He might even think it's evidentially based, right? He might think the alien that told him that there's a multiverse, right, after he drank all the cough syrup was a perfectly reliable guy, right? Okay, or, or do you see what I mean? Or, and, and so the idea there is, is whether or not his belief is true, whether or not it's based on evidence, it's off the table because there's sheep bandits afoot, right? Do, do you see what I mean? Like something's wrong, okay? He's not believing this because there's reasons. He's believing it because he's been caused physically to believe this. Okay, D does that distinction make any sense to you? Okay, because it's going to be important for what goes on here, all right? Okay, so... Um, just to, I'm just going to read my paragraph here. I kind of said it, but I like it, so we'll do it. All right. So, in the space of reasons, because indicates a sort of rational or normative standing. Somebody has reasons, and these reasons explain his belief. Whereas in the space of causes, 
because indicates a causal, non-rational, non-normative relation. Smitty is made to believe regardless of the available reasons. And something's making him do it. Notice that in the space of causes, Smitty's belief could be true, though he's not really entitled to it. And Smitty could be wrong about why he believes it. In the former case, the consequent of the because is, is sensitive to the truth of the antecedent, but in the latter case, the consequent is indifferent to the truth of the antecedent. Right? Like Smitty's going after the truth in the first case, even if he doesn't get it. Thus, in the space of causes, Smitty's belief is not rational. There's an uh, indirect incompatibility between Smitty's belief in the multiverse and his overindulgence in over-the-counter remedies. Okay. All right, now, a typical assumption, and I'm just going to operate by it, but I, when, I, when I point out a typical assumption, it's maybe controversial, right? But typically, this is what people assume. All right. Is, is the, is, here's the, the assumption. If a belief is explained by the space of causes, then it is not explained in the space of reasons, right? So if we know Smitty's been like getting into too much cough syrup, we're going to pretty much assume, even if he's citing the astrophysics literature, we're worried about where he is, right? Do, do, do you see what I mean? Okay. So in general, we take it there's an incompatibility here, All right? Okay. So here's the worry. I'm going to give you a little argument, okay? Uh, and this is an argument I'm taking like an evolutionary skeptic about religion might make. Okay, it's not my argument, it's the argument that I'm, I've come here to critique for you. Okay, so premise one, if evolution, right, then religion is explained by natural selection in terms of reproductive advantage. Two, reproductive advantage is an explanation in the space of causes. Therefore, three, right, trivially, if evolution, then religion is explained in the space of causes. Right? We don't believe it because it's true. We believe it because these other things that happened to us in our distant past, right, uh, that gave us advantage in warfare or, or, or breeding or what have you. Four, evolution is very likely. Therefore, five, religion is explained in the space of causes. Therefore, religion is not explained in the space of reasons, right? And so the idea here is, is not to say that religion isn't true. It's to say we're not good judges about it. We're kind of set up to believe it by the cough syrup that's left over in our system, right, uh, given what happened in, like, Africa 100,000 years ago. Do you, do you see that, right? So, like, what, what the evolutionary uh, skeptic about religion is, or the evolutionary skeptic about morality or anything, right, is essentially saying is we've all had too much cough syrup, right, or all our ancestors had too much cough syrup, so now we all operate under this sort of, like, at what was a useful delusion, which is religion? Or even if it's not delusional, right, even if there are supernatural things, the evolutionary skeptic's still going to say, that's not why you believe it. You believe it because it gave it an adaptive advantage to your ancestors. Do you see that? Uh, and so whatever our relationship to religion is then, on this claim, it's not rational. Okay. Do you have a sense of that? Okay. And, and I, I find this, you know, an interesting though troubling argument, okay? All right, but I don't think we should despair over this, okay? Um, as I put it here on your handout, I'm on the back side now, there's an ambiguity in the basic assumption regarding what is meant by belief that should lead us to doubt the first premise of this argument and actually might have other consequences that are bad for the argument too, okay? But I think there's an ambiguity in, the, in belief here and what we mean by a belief, okay? So I think there's three components of belief, right? Uh, and what's true of one of them doesn't necessarily follow for the other ones, okay? So I think we need to tease these out to get a sense of what's really going on in this argument and to see whether it's actually a good argument or a bad argument, okay? So first, I think we can talk about the belief consciousness, all right? which is the qualitative or intentional or logical content of holding a belief. It's something like what it's like to be thinking it's a snake, okay? Whether it's a mental image or a concept or something like that, okay? So there's the, the, the consciousness that we associate with holding a certain belief. There's the belief behavior. Those are the patterns of overt behavior following on a belief. For example, avoiding the snake. And notice, as I'm going to talk about in a minute here, is I could have the belief behavior without having the belief consciousness, right? Um, 
I'm probably doing all sorts of that right now. Like I'm not, well, now that I'm gonna say it, I'm like, I'm not overtly thinking that, you know, my left shoe is still on, but I'm sure as heck what? Behaving as if it were, do, do, do you see that? Okay, so the important thing to know here, these are distinct things, okay? And we can also talk about the belief physiology, all right? The biological structures or neurophysiology that are requisite for a belief. Say the standard neural pathway that is excited under the conditions in which a human is in the presence of a snake. Okay. So I think one could, and people often do, mean any one of those three things when we talk about someone holding a belief. Right? We might mean the actual consciousness of it. Okay. We might mean uh, the behavior associated with it. Okay. Or we might mean the physiology right, that somehow like, like undergirds maybe both the consciousness and the behavior, okay? All right, so things to note about this. A, right, the space of reasons is a kind of belief consciousness, right? If, you know, if Smitty's in the space of reasons, he's thinking about what he should or shouldn't believe, right? He's taking his beliefs up into consciousness, right? There's a way it's like to be there. B, belief behavior does not entail belief consciousness. I just made this point, at least not immediately. For, instance, for example, I can follow the behavior pattern of believing the chair is under me without any consciousness as such, right? You're all behaving as if you believe your chair is there, right? Okay, now, you, now you're conscious of it because I said it, right? But it's hard to talk about that one, okay? C, belief physiology does not entail belief consciousness. For example, no belief physiology and it's a snake are identical. I'm going to defend that in a minute here because that's going to be controversial, okay? D, we have good reason to believe that belief, phys belief physiology is sufficient in a certain context for belief behavior and otherwise relevant neurophysiological states. I'll come back to that one in a moment. E, evolution by natural selection explains belief only to the degree the behavior of the belief contrib contributes to reproductive fitness. Okay, so that's important, all right? Uh, evolution selects for behavior, right? That's what evolution wants, is, is, is behavior, okay? And evolution is indifferent to the consciousness associated with the behavior, and it might even be indifferent to the physiology in that it's like whatever physiology gets to the behavior, evolution doesn't care, okay? So like an example I'll use here is like you've got two, say, like, like cavemen, there's gonna be a lot of cavemen like thought experiments now, okay, so <laughs> beware. You have like two cavemen in a forest. I guess they're, they're forest men, but that's okay. You have two cavemen in a forest. All right, and the forest, you know, there's a, there's a massive forest fire, and one of them has a physiological response to that, right, and associated with that physiological response says, oh my gosh, like the mean kinetic energy of all the molecules in my body is about to like take a really steep climb, so I better get the hell out of here, right? Okay, and then the other, monk, the other uh, uh, caveman says, oh, you know, he has a physiological response, and the consciousness associated with that is, oh my gosh, the fire demons are back, and they're going to carry me off to hell and torture me forever. So he's going to what? He's going to get the hell out of the forest, okay? Who gets a date that day? Potentially what? They both do. Do, do, do you see that, okay? So what's the point is, like, an, any consciousness could do the trick as long as what? We get the behavior out of it. Do, do, do you see the point there? Okay, right? And evolution, what evolution selects for is like dating success, right? And both cavemen survive to like, you know, I don't know, like go on Tinder or whatever they did, right? Okay, right? <laughs> to like date later that day. Do, do, do you see my point? Okay, so the two, the two consciousnesses there's no advantage one way or another there as long as like the physiology gets them out of there, okay? And now this is going to be another important point is it does, like, like, there's very good reason to think you don't need the belief consciousness at all to get the behavior, okay? I mean, we're, we're, we're aware of like kind of like famous like psychology 101 examples about how you know, you're already pulling your hand back from the hot stove before you consciously feel it, right? There's pretty good evidence of this. Do, do, do you see that, right? Um, so there, it doesn't, the consciousness doesn't do any of the work in the behavior there, right? All the work is done 
by the physiology, the neurophysiology, well, and downstream too, and the overt behavior that it causes. Do, do you see that? Okay, so this is something a lot of philosophers, even secular philosophers, have begun to worry about. It's really hard to give an evolutionary explanation of belief consciousness because it seems like the physiology as a cause of the behavior does the work, right? Okay, and I think, I, I think a lot of times like, like religious people get scared of this, right? Because they're like admitting evolution is like giving an explanation, but actually there's a real big dangling problem here now like for, for a naturalist, right? In that we've got this consciousness thing and it's very hard to see what work that does in an evolutionary context. All right, so maybe you see where this is going now, right? All right, so let me talk about C. So C is um, belief physiology does not entail belief consciousness. That is, no belief physiology and it's a snake are identical, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do another caveman thought experiment here, all right? And um, I actually did if, uh, a TI talk, like a whole hour on this particular point um, so you can find it probably in the SoundCloud channel, okay? If it's, uh, I'm going to kind of go through it quickly. We can, we can get after the question and answer too, but I'm going to give you the short version here, all right? So suppose Zeta, okay, and just to just coin a phrase, right, is the belief physiology associated with the belief consciousness. Paris is the capital of the Fifth French Republic, okay? So Zeta would be, uh, you know, whatever, like the, the, the neural network that we, we, and once again, this is a really crass way to think about the neurosciences, okay, but just for the sake of arguments, just do this. Zeta is the neural network that we'd, we would typically find correlated, if we could do it, right, and we're not quite there yet, uh, with the, the consciousness of, like, the thinking that Paris is the capital of Fifth French Republic, okay? All right, now, consider a case in which a prehistoric human is put into Zeta fortu fortuitously centuries before Paris ever existed. Okay, so you got our proverbial caveman, and I don't know what happens. He gets struck by lightning, you know, you know he, gets, he gets hit in the head by, you know, uh, a rock or something, and by some super low science fiction probability, it causes that pathway. This is not how pathways generally get formed, but that's part of my point, actually. We'll see here in a minute. Um, that pathway gets formed. So, bing, Zeta, Zeta happens, okay? I find it very, very hard to believe that, that the default position should be that that caveman is now having the belief consciousness of Paris as the Fifth French Republic, right? Centuries, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years before Paris existed, right? Do you, do you see my point, right? Um, and this, I, this, this is also why I have like a lot of impatience with like brains and vats scenarios and stuff like that, is like the case that I would wanna make to you, I guess I am making, right? is like our Zeta, okay, whatever it is, manages to have belief consciousness about Paris because we formed it by, you know, look, I mean, maybe, maybe you've traveled to Paris, right? Or maybe like your parents honeymooned in Paris, right? Maybe you've read books about Paris. Maybe you've had lectures from professors you greatly admired about Paris, right? There's this, there's all these things that have put you in a kind of contact with Paris, okay? right, um, that go beyond your neurophysiology, right? The neurophysiology might be a necessary condition for it, but it's not sufficient, right? Because uh, the way we get our neurophysiology is in like a real world where we're dealing with the objects, right, that our belief consciousness is about. Do, do, you, do you see my point there, okay? So I'm not, I'm not trying to make like some argument against materials or something like that. I'm just trying to make this point is that However it is we get belief consciousness, it's not just from the neurophysiology. Because I think something like a caveman with a bump on the head who fortuitously gets essentially a, a neural pathway formed as a brain injury, right? It's hard to believe that that person's having like the conscious thought, oh, Paris is the fifth French Republic, even before, <laughs> right, there's been a fifth French Republic. Okay, now, maybe you say, yeah, but like, that's a really crass way to think about neural pathways because they're never alone, so you'd have to like maybe have him get bumped in the head so many times he gets like a whole like duplicate one for one of like one of our brains. Fair enough, we'll go Star Trek, let's do that. All right, but I still think it's very hard to believe even in that scenario in like the Paleolithic period or you know even earlier that this guy is thinking about Paris at that point before the city even ever existed, okay? 
And I'm not saying that the, neuro, that the neurophysiology isn't necessary for the belief consciousness. I'm saying it's not sufficient. They're not the same thing. Okay. And I am saying this, is that I think you could have the physiology and not have the belief consciousness. Do, do you see that? Okay. And now this is the rub for my argument now, is, well, sure, if you can give me an evolutionary explanation of the behavior and then the underlying uh, uh, belief physiology, it doesn't follow then that you've thereby given me an evolutionary explanation of the belief consciousness. Right? Because the, the physiology doesn't have to have the belief consciousness in order for it to come about and to be useful. Okay. All right, so here's how I put that. So there are consequences now. First, a complete explanation of belief behavior could be given indifferent to any associated belief consciousness. Explanations of behavior do not necessarily explain consciousness. This is the, my two cavemen in the, in the burning forest example. Two, an explanation of belief physiology does not necessarily explain any associated belief consciousness. That is, explanations of physiology alone do not necessarily explain consciousness. Thus, three, if a physiological explanation of belief behavior can be given, that does not necessarily explain the associated consciousness. In short, even though we have a space of causes explanation of the behavior and physiology of some belief, it does not follow that we thereby have a space of causes explanation of its consciousness. Okay? All that work was like to get us to that point. All right. So now, when it comes to religious belief, right, we've got religious consciousness, right? the qualitative and intentional content of the religious belief. We've got religious behavior, uh, the patterns of gross bodily movement of religious belief, maybe like ritual, something like that. Okay. And then we've got religious physiology, the biological structures, neurophysiology of religious belief. Okay. So now, we have to go back now, because there's three things we could mean by religion, religion now, right? We could mean the consciousness, we could mean the behavior, we, have to, we could mean the physiology. So you have to go back now and look at premise one and ask, which one do we mean here when we say um, religion? Okay. So first, if evolution, then religious behavior is explained by natural selection in terms of reproductive advantage. Okay, fair enough. B, if evolution, then religious physiology is explained by natural selection in terms of reproductive advantage. All right. C, if evolution, then religious consciousness is explained by natural selection in terms of reproductive advantage. Okay. So I'm willing to grant A. I think there's pretty good evidence of that. Okay at least provisionally. Basic evolutionary principles tell us physiology is there for the sake of behavior. So given A, uh, we then have good reason for B, right? However, both religious behavior and religious phys physiology can go on without religious consciousness. So the fact that evolution puts the former two into the space of causes does nothing with respect to the latter. Thus, the conclusion of the evolutionary skeptic's argument applies only to physiology and behavior and not to consciousness, right? This haven't shown anything one way or another about consciousness, okay? All right, okay, a couple of things to clean up, <laughs> all right? So first, if re religious physiology is insufficient for religious consciousness, then what is, okay? All right, consider again Zeta as the physiology that supports the consciousness. Paris is the capital of the Fifth Republic. The difference between Zeta is, uh, in one of us and Zeta in a hypothetical prehistoric human is that, our, is that our Zeta is formed by a process that ultimately maybe remotely deals with Paris. Likewise, a religious physiology grounds religious consciousness when it is formed by actually dealing with an object. What that object is, what gives religious consciousness its content, is of course a matter of some dispute. Okay? I'm, not saying it, it, I'm not saying this shows that religion is true, but if we're going to say there's a consciousness involved with it, we should get a sense of well, what are we talking about when we appeal to this consciousness, right? and what in the world are we dealing with right? uh, when, we're, when we're doing that. Okay? And if you say, well, because it's religious, it's delusional, there's no such thing in the world, well, you've just begged a lot of questions there, right? You've moved this from an argument about that's trying to show we're unreliable about religion to assuming that we're unreliable about religion. Do, do you see that? So then we're just kind of back to natural theology, and we can fight that out, okay? So note, 
A, we cannot conclude that religious consciousness is gained by working with an object very different from its phenomenal character, a delusion, without some prior reason to suppose that religious consciousness is non-veridical. Otherwise, one begs the question. That is the point of the religious debate. B, the claim that any physiology for which the space of causes explanation can be given, for example, in terms of reproductive advantage, undermines its corresponding consciousness's standing in the space of reasons implies a self-refuting skepticism, the ultimate universal acid, to take a term from Dennett, right? So here's my, my that last point there. It's like, if you're going to say simply because we have a physiological evolutionary explanation of the physiology of religious belief, that thereby shows it's undermined, right? Well, we can give a physiological evolutionary adaptive advantage as to why we're good at physics, too, okay? We could do that as to why we're good at math, too, probably, right? Okay, if we put our heads together, you see what I mean? Like, there's evolutionary direct uh, explanations in all directions. So if you're going to say just because we can explain the behavior and the physiology evolutionarily that undermines our standing to hold of certain belief, then we've just got to become general skeptics, right? Because it does seem like we have an evolutionary conditioned physiology underlying all of our beliefs. Okay, does that make sense? All right, that is what I have for you. Thank you. And they threatened me with questions, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say. No, please, go. Do your thing. They're paying you. <laughs> They're not paying me. <laughs> oh, wait, you didn't. Oh. We'll just now open um, the room for discussion so you can ask any questions to a professor. Yeah. Yeah, so just one comment on your last point that sure. I thought was interesting. You concluded by saying that uh, if you're, since you can apply the same kind of naturalistic evolutionary perspective could, could. Could, towards uh, any other field of sort of human knowledge or reasoning, that you could, then you're left with a choice between one that would affirm that, okay, maybe in some cases, even if there's an evolutionary explanation for the physiology behind this, we can still use reason and have get real information from it. Or the alternative being skepticism, like you said, I think it's actually even a bit more stark than that, perhaps, because ultimately the, the basis in the like sort of conversation with the naturalist is that they're saying that they used ultimately reason and evidence correct to they're claiming to be basic reasons yeah yeah to, in order to support their theory yeah. so really it's not it doesn't just move on to skepticism it makes their claims just completely self-refuting because they 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 the reason that we believe in evolution or not believe but you know is because we've observed things that we think support that theory. So it, 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 yeah. it's, it goes beyond skepticism and just makes a complete muddle of. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And, and, really, and really, I think we're, we're both riffing on Alvin Plantinga here, right? Yeah. It, it's something like, you see, yeah. No, no, please keep yeah. going. But my second point, um, another thing you can kind of tease apart with the initial sort of uh, arguments you have sketched in the front, the skeptical argument is the notion of religion. Uh, in, in the West, we have like, our concept of religion, which you know we imagine paganism, Roman religion, yeah. we imagine uh, Christianity, spe specifically Catholicism. But you know, religion is a very contentious word that means a lot of different things, right? Like, really like, yeah, right, right. And also, you know, there's, I mean, there's really a lot of sort of modern things, sort of like civic and political religion that behave very much like religion, even though they do, like, don't make supernatural claims. It's easy to see how similar like behavioral or social pathways support those same kinds of collective actions. I'm really reminded of like uh, what's the book uh, Imagined Communities about the origins of nationalism there. But it, you know it seems like you, if you also wanted to attack this argument from a second direction, you could attack the notion of religion as this coherent thing that contains everything from very modern uh, theistic argument all the way down to. Um, reasoning uh, like that a primitive person or not like you know like someone in an ancient tribe would do when they're forced when they you know experience forces of nature that they can't comprehend so it seems like that that notion of religion itself is kind of tricky and it does play a big role in their argument in the first place because you're reducing a lot of different and disparate human phenomena that rely on a lot of different things for instance christianity is not just a, a, a practice but it also it's a set of historical and philosophical claims right so i think that um, that's just another way to look at it. But this already, I think, is pretty solid in, in, as far as yeah, the yeah. Thanks, Thanks for bringing all that up. And, it, and here, here's the thing is, is, I agree with everything you said. So basically, uh, I, uh, I read 
Matt Rossano's book, and then I wanted to have a chapter on it in my book, but I couldn't pull it off. Okay, and so then I, I, got, to, I got to see him speak at the American Catholic Philosophical Association last year. Blew me away. So I'm kind of trying to, like, show, hey, m maybe Matt's stuff isn't a threat. <laughs> and so what I did intentionally is I took basically how he defines religion, because what and he, in the book he actually – uh, goes out of the way to actually address exactly what you're saying. Not that you're objecting, but like to address what you're saying is what he's going to say. What I mean by religion is going to be about actually having belief in the supernatural, because he thinks it's the belief in the supernatural that gave us the adaptive advantage. Like he thinks that any kind of like attempt at cohesion that doesn't have an appeal to the supernatural is not going to probably hold long term, and he thinks that the supernatural part of it is like what is kind of what God is going on working memory and abstraction in a way. You see what I mean? Uh, so I intentionally narrowed it to just just to be in contact with that. But I think everything you said is like, is, is spot on. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, I think a lot of naturalists that I have met who kind of basically define religion and all beliefs in general as nothing more than what you described as religious um, physiology yeah. in some sense. So they wouldn't even acknowledge the existence, I think, of what you define as religious consciousness. Do you think that they're dispersed with this argument and work against it? No, if, 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 you're, if you're dealing with sort of like a, an eliminative materialist or someone who's like going to say there's just no such thing as consciousness, then I don't think the argument has any grip, right? Do you see what I mean? So I think you'd have to have some motivation not to be a, 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 an eliminativist about consciousness. But I don't think it's hard to get that motivation, right? Do you know what I mean? But I don't want to be, I don't want to be snotty about that either, right? Do you know what I mean? Because there are bright people who hold the view, okay? But yeah, I think in order for this to work, we have to like, basically be sold in the notion that, that among the facts, there are conscious facts. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, two short questions of clarification. Sure. Though, we, so because it, it seems to me you reject the typical assumption that the space of reason, the space of causes, um, contradict each other, you reject that. Do you want me to answer that right away? Sorry? Do you want me to answer that right away? Yeah, go Yeah, so I'm, I am trying to be agnostic on that. Okay, because I'll admit that that's something I, I like lie awake at night and can't sleep but worrying about. Okay, it's, it's me. You don't have to worry about it, but it's my thing. Okay, okay so maybe for like 30 years. Okay, so, um, but what, what I want to say, I, I'm kind of granting it, okay, for the sake of argument, though I'm not, it's, I'm not sure really where I'm going to come out on that, okay? But I'm granting it for the sake of argument and saying, though, we can say, yeah, if you've got, if you've got space of causes, you don't have space of reasons, right? Um, and then I'm saying, yeah, the evolutionary argument gives us space of causes with physiology, and it gives it with behavior, but it doesn't necessarily show it in the case of, of consciousness, because there's this gap between consciousness and the physiology. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And my second short question is, and you kind of just answered it, but once you grant that, you grant that, um, in one sense, that because they're compatible, they're almost even to sense that, um, well, granting that, it seems to me it makes defense of C kind of hard. Your, your defense of C kind of hard because, um, I mean, even by definition, the belief in physiology is just a prerequisite the structure that you need for the belief in the first place, as, as I understand it. Belief in what sense? Uh, belief consciousness. I mean, yeah. just how would you, you know, just it's a fortuitous hypothetical that you know, in actuality people have the theorics of this uh, physiology have the belief in consciousness. Yeah. So it seems well, important to see. Yeah. Right? Well, I, I think you can, you can admit that um, in organisms like us, you're going to have to have something like zeta for this to go on. In normal cases. There's weird cases, too. You know, you have people with like severe like brain injury or like big chunks of their brain missing that they, they, they're able to like still adapt and have it work, right? But in the, in the normal case, we're all going to need, say, Zeta to do this, okay? Um, I still don't think that shows me that the belief physiology is identical with the belief um, consciousness, right? Because I think to this thought experiment shows you could, have, you could have the one without the other, right? And I'm not claiming you could have in this, in this paper, right? I'm not claiming you could have the belief consciousness without the physiology. I'm just claiming you could have the physiology without the consciousness. So if you want an explanation of the consciousness, you need more than the physiology. 
Do you see what I mean? So then if you have an evolutionary explanation of the physiology, it doesn't necessarily, I know I'm Weasley here, right? It doesn't necessarily follow that you then have an evolutionary explanation of the consciousness. Unless you interpret K's just based on the basis. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So that's, I can see why that's yeah, yeah. different. Yeah, 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 definitely. Definitely. yeah, yeah, it should, yeah, right. Yeah, yes, sir. So you said in the, your response to the first question, that, yeah, you're wrapping up planning a, and in your speech you mentioned warrant is like an offhand term. Yeah. So does anything in your argument necessitate an externalist theory of justification? Or can you just toss in any really theory of justification you want and the argument still works? Do you think Zeta requires you know, something? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, man. Good question. Um, so really a lot of a lot of your people who like the vocabulary of space of reasons are going to tend to be internalists okay all right and i put the warrant in there right just to say even if you even if you go planning route i still think the argument works basically because planning does right do you see what i mean so yeah i i think it does work internalist right i actually think it might even work better internalist okay though uh in a lot of ways i'm an externalist about belief content right which, that's another issue, right? Good. Very good question. Yeah, yes, sir. So I totally agree with like the epistemology you laid out, but like let's say for argument's sake, I'll omit their epistemology on like space of reason and space of cause. Yeah. Do you think that a naturalist worldview can reconcile arguments from logical necessity because you would be appealing to the same logical structures that they would use for say math, physics, etc. Give it to me again. I'm not yeah, sorry. sorry. So, like, I, I agree with the outline that you laid out, but let's say for argument's sake, you will say, okay, just religious claims are in the realm of space of cause, yeah. but arguments for God's existence from logical necessity, yeah. like the modal ontological oh, argument, sure, sure. contingency, would a naturalist worldview be able to reconcile arguments from logical necessity? Um, I mean, that, that's a famously difficult issue. Do you see what I mean? Um, I, I and, and a lot of it will have to do if, if you think a naturalist, if once, you, if once you go naturalist, if you have to see everything undercut by evolution, which of course that's like Planetary's view, okay? Um, leaving that aside, okay, um, I don't quite know what to do when a naturalist, and I mean this like in a good sense, right? Yeah, I don't quite know what to do when a naturalist says, hey, at some point explanation stops and there just are necessary truths, right? And I don't need an explanation for them, right? Um, I think when, some, like, when someone appeals the theoretical rock bottom, it's gonna happen at some point, do, do you see what I mean? So I don't find myself quite compelled by that, by those sorts of things, right. does that make sense? Yeah. So you think it'd be more advantageous to address this epistemological error of like, oh, you have an unrealistic standard of religious consciousness. Yeah. So addressing that yeah. rather than just trying to argue from logical necessity. Oh, I see. Oh, I, I, thought you, I thought you were asking something different. So I, I thought you were asking, like, can a naturalist make sense of there being like valid arguments? Okay. That's a, there's an interesting issue about that. I think, I don't know that one has to make sense of valid arguments. Okay. But you're just say, saying, hey, why not just go with natural theology? Yeah, well, actually, what I do in the end is I basically appeal to natural theology, yeah. right? You know what I mean? So I want to say is, look, look, let's, let's kick the undercutting name-calling aside. You know, you're irrational. No, you're irrational. You're undercut. You're undercut. We, if we want to play that game, then we can all give a just-so story about everybody's position, right? Do you see what I mean? Like, as soon as you go psychological in the explanation, so, like, as soon as we go space of causes, well, that works for everybody. Right. We can all come up with something there and, and make it plausible, Right. So I, th that's my whole point. It's like, look, we can, there's a defense to be made here of religious belief, okay? Um, and if they want to push, then it seems like they're going to end up in the same position with their own. So let's go play natural theology instead, right? Yeah, good, good question. Yeah. Um, I mean, you hold Catholic beliefs, so how would you say, like, 
And so, in your connecting, this is a really interesting question, because I never thought of it before, so now I'm in trouble, I'm stalling. Okay, so, um, so, you're, so you're connecting religious diversity, and like the vast religious diversity, right, with that would then seem to lend itself to an evolutionary explanation. Okay. First, I'm not sure about that connection. I'm not sure like, where we see greater diversity that, that like, pushes us towards an evolutionary uh, explanation, as opposed to maybe it speaks against it, right? Because it would then seem like, so like, like pretty much all, all humans, right, are run, like got the same liver, more or less, right? Not a lot, not a lot of diversity in, in like the liver, okay? Um, because there's not a lot of like space of reasons, consciousness stuff that goes into like the history of, of, of the liver. Do you see what I mean? Okay. Um, like we didn't come up with the liver by like consciously working with problems. Right? Okay, but we got a lot of different religions, right? Well, that seems, you see, like there's a disanalogy there but with physiology. And, like, and maybe the reason we got uh, different religions is because, in fact, consciousness is fallible and it does make it a contribution to the development of religion in a way that would not just be straightforwardly physicalist evolution. Do, do you see that? So I, I wonder if maybe like the kind of the, the sticky mess of religious diversity is actually an argument against its evolution, not for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sir. Um, yeah, I, I, I felt the, um, the similarity with the uh, evolutionary argument against natural. And I was wondering if you could bolster the defense of seeing using that, of course, as, uh, well, I mean, just to show that belief consciousness cannot be purely material. Right? Mm -hmm. So that may well work, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of avoiding doing that. Okay, because I, other, yeah. Some other argument for the, that, that uh, okay. content cannot be determined uh, just by some material configuration, right? If, you, if you've got like a knockdown, drag out good argument for dualism, that'll do it for C, right? right? Whatever that is. Do you see what I mean? Um, what I want to do, and this is kind of the project, this, like I said, this grows out of my, the recent book length project I did, is I want to kind of have as like ontologically neutral and austere view as I can, right? And then see what I can get away with it. You see what I mean? So I'm not taking a stance here, right? on whether or not the belief consciousness is material or immaterial. I would even claim I don't even really know what that means anymore, right? What I am saying is the neurophysiology does not, is, it's not identical to neurophysiology, right? And therefore, the evolutionary account of neurophysiology doesn't explain it. You know what I mean? But the easier way to do that is like, if you've got a good dualist argument, done, right? Do you see what I mean? Uh, I'm kind of taking the hard route here, though, yeah. But I do think, yeah, if you've got, if you've got some good metaphysics up your sleeve for that, it would work. Yeah, yeah, sir. sir. Um, you said that earlier that neither um, religious explanation of, uh, you said it's a case of like fire, religious explanation, and then the neurological explanation, yeah. neither one gives a direct identity. Could it be said that one has a benefit because it's easier to believe? I don't know if I just, like, for yeah. example, you said mean kinetic energy. Yeah, yeah sure, yes. Fire, uh, like, a came in with necessarily understanding. No, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah, a better crafted argument would have them on par. They, they both be pretty quick. They either be both very complicated or both pretty simple, right? Yeah, I agree. So, like, evolution would, well, the, thing, my, the point of that, though, is, is to say the consciousness isn't really doing the work because you could have a lot of different consciousnesses, right? And as long as the physiology was in order, you would get out of the forest, right?
Yeah, yeah, yeah one more. Yeah, you have good questions. Uh, when my oldest son turned 13, he wanted to, wanted to try boxing. All right. And um, we're not into telling our kids no about that kind of thing. It's like, okay, well, let's try it. And I couldn't find a boxing gym near us, but I found a judo club. Okay. So it's his 13th birthday. We got in the car. We drove the judo club. We did the birds and the bees on the way there. <laughs> right? It's 13th birthday. That's what we do in our house. And, and, then, and then we... And then we uh, we got in the mat, we did judo together, and said, like, okay, we're going to do this together, and then, like, that club folded after a year, but one of our instructors was a jiu-jitsu guy, too, and he said, we should just come over and start training with us at the jiu-jitsu gym, and then my oldest and I went and started there, and then all the other boys got into it, and then our daughter got into it, and now my wife is into it, yeah, so that's how we got into it, yeah. It was a birthday present to my son. Yeah. Very good. All right, thank you. Yeah.